and we're going to talk about the uh, application abstraction. And I'd like to turn it over to Joel Moses from F5. Great. Can uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see your slides. Okay, fantastic. Let me just make sure I got the chat window up. I'm sure I'll have some questions here. Um, so I, we're going to kind of up level it from target abstraction to application abstraction. Um, which is kind of something near and dear to our heart as kind of an ISV in this particular uh, role set. Um, and, and so I wanted to kind of pull the discussion back a little bit towards, uh, towards customer use cases. Uh, and I thought the best way to do that would be to take some of the slides that we saw from today and yesterday uh, that I thought were particularly relevant to the discussion of what an application for a DPU actually looks like. Uh, and then kind of overlay on top of that some things just to think about. Um, so uh, this, this, I believe, was in Dell's slide deck, uh, but it, it kind of details some very high level infrastructure style use cases where, uh, where you're working either uh, with, with a, 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 a NIC in classic mode or a smart NIC that does infrastructure tasks uh, and then you're extending past that and you're actually doing more and more work, leveraging more and more of the DP resources. Um, I, I'm, I'm displaying this slide to point out that there's, there's differences in exactly how much you use uh, of the infrastructure that you're given. Um, hang on a sec, let me just, here we go. Uh, I also uh, just saw this slide, I believe this came from Marvell and I think it, it, it illustrates uh, what we view of the world uh, to be uh, fairly well from, from what DPUs are beginning to be able to offer us the possibility to do for customers, downstream end users of, of DPUs and of software that can adequately use the DPUs to perform certain work. Um, and this, this breaks it down pretty well into, I think, two halves of the problem set. One is the host or hosting system. And the host and hosting system can ab absolutely run an application in and of itself. Uh, in fact, I, I expect that that's going to be a very common scenario, that, uh, that the, the host system is a container system that hosts a variety of applications that are directly accessed by end users. The DPU then becomes an area to run certain what I'm going to call DPU applications that are generally either in support of the host applications, assistive to the host applications, or optimizing of the host applications, um, or providing services directly to the host application. Um, I think it's pretty clear here. So you've got, you've got a number of categories like infrastructure offload and DPU hosted services some of which are firewall services, IDS, IPS, uh, load balancing services could be there as well. Uh, you've got infrastructure offload, so things like IPsec and, and OVS, for example, but also things that you would think of less classically like, um, like mask tunneling, uh, where you may want to provide infrastructure to, to in-cap and decap in advance of the host application because the host application isn't expected to understand uh, how to how to to in tunnel and de tunnel. Uh, you want to provide that capability in some detached infrastructure layer, so that the the application itself doesn't have to be rewritten or written specifically to support that functionality. Um, so I, I I've got some observations here, and this is my view of the world. And uh, feel free to absolutely disagree with the way that I characterize this or, or the way that you, you think that F5 views the world. Um, I'm observing that there are two basic contexts. One is the host application or things that are running on host. And then there are DPU applications, which are applications uh, of a DPU that are very tied to the use cases for the host. So some candidate DPU applications are intended entirely to support, test, monitor, or secure host applications. So these could be um, uh, in inline monitoring uh, using uh, open telemetry, for example, uh, support services. So um, uh, th that might be in-cap, decap, testing services. So programming a DPU to test upstream and downstream towards the application so that you can, you can locally test performance of an application. Um, these are all candidate applications for things that DPUs might be good at doing. Uh, 
Uh, some candidate DT DPU applications are those that have specific op uh, optimization needs. And I'm going to cover one of those specifically from the meta presentation from yesterday. Um, these are applications that need to be hosted on a DPU because they need to uh, have specific domain uh, performance characteristics. Um, and we'll cover that in a second. Uh, and also host applications absolutely need access to accelerator resources as well. And it would be good if the accelerator resources that they can access would be accessed in, in consistent ways across multiple types of hardware. Um, does anybody have any comments on these four observations before I move ahead and we start talking use cases? Don't don't you don't have to raise your hands or anything like Rob did. So so Joel, are there DPU application use cases where the DPU application isn't necessarily <clears throat> intended strictly for supporting something running on the local host, but might be instead providing services for applications on other hosts? Uh, that, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I, I this this slide I, I noticed was was also in the previous. Uh, breakout, but I've I've kind of detailed a few things here: uh, clustering or or uh, or ensuring communication policy across met components in a service provider network, or clustering components maybe across uh, multiple DPU sets, um, handling the cluster outside of the application resources on the host is is, is a potential yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the low hanging fruit is is to stand up services that are very associated with the local host application. Right. So I, I've tried to, on this, uh, on this diagram, kind of overlay some of the services that I think might actually be uh, particularly relevant as DPU side applications. Now, I'm not saying that, that it's a perfect fit in every scenario, uh, but these are some of the areas where we personally, when, as we supply software to service providers, um, we're often asked about uh, how to do this in, in a more efficient way. Um, so for example, um, in terms of infrastructure management, often there's a need for independent from host infrastructure management and, um, uh, and services. So, so things like CGNAT uh, on the enterprise side, uh, uh, firewall policies that can be applied that are, are host invisible or host untouchable. Uh, mass tunneling, uh, DDoS mitigation is often a, a request where, where we can uh, uh, more adequately use some of the accelerated resources in front of a container environment, for example, uh, to do, to do DDoS mitigation um, in a programmatic fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, packet gateway is another. I, mean, I think something like a quick proxy would be really useful too. It, it, absolutely. And, and I would have I would have categorized it like that to say that these are sort of infrastructure applications, as opposed to saying it's a DPU or IPU specific function. I, I just think that at least marketing wise, you know, I, I don't think you want to um, be identifying these things as sort of you know they're sort of unique or or, or had to have been developed because you introduced the, the the this new device into the system. I would have thought that hey, these are infrastructure applications yep. that you're going to want anyways. And yes, they can be accelerated by a DPU IPU, but to call it the, a, a DPU application just it, it doesn't feel doesn't seem like it's a, a good a, a good label because uh, you know presumably all of these functions needed to be there yeah. even before you had that device. Yeah, Dan, this is why I'm not in marketing. Um, uh, it, I, it's it's just a, a thing that I'm using to describe it to you guys and to to myself. Um, but these are infrastructure side applications. Now there are certain applications though that are customer side or customer end users type applications. Um, let me jump ahead. I'm gonna come back to this slide, but uh, you know, yesterday Meta talked in depth about what they needed in terms of uh, AI and ML processing. Uh, and they have a particular need to do pre-processing of streams uh, into uh, data that, that put, is put directly into storage for model processing. Uh, and they, they made the point that supporting services uh, out of the total training cluster that they developed, supporting services like pre-processing of streams is oftentimes uh, 
a higher commit than the training cluster itself. Um, and that's, that's I'm, I'm assuming, and I, I can't speak for them directly, but I'm assuming that has something to do with the, the expense of handling the decryption, uh, handling uh, stream reassembly, uh, ensuring that the stream is converted and, and processed in a certain way, perhaps normalization as a function there. Uh, and there are onboard DPU functions that allow us to process streams in a much more efficient manner. Uh, and at the same time, the ability to attach to storage um, uh, in, in maybe a DMA fashion that allows us to remove certain copies from the process. And, and uh, he indicated that, that the, the, the fewer the number of copies and the more things stay in memory space, uh, the better it is just for that ingestion pipeline. So I, I could envision a, 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 a scenario where a DPU might have a, uh, might have a, a reader function uh, from this slide that is specifically tuned to process streams very quickly uh, and and uh, and DMA directly into storage. Um, th that that could be something custom, of course, for Meta, but it, it it's representative of something that might might be a a good use of resources. It it isolates the training, the host that does the training from the stream preprocessor, um, and it much more efficiently is capable of handling that stream function. Any any questions about that? I have a comment, Joel. I just wonder if you think that um, where some of the vendors are sort of indicating they're going to go, doing things like hanging extra accelerators, potentially a GPU or an FPGA off of a DPU where the DPU is hosting those other accelerators. Do you feel mm -hmm. like that's going to drive even more end user applications onto DPUs themselves? Because it seems like you could use those GPUs only to accelerate infrastructure services, but I could see use cases where the end user applications want to be able to use them directly. What do you think? I, I think that that's also true. I mean, uh, any, any accelerator resource that you put in, if, especially if it's densely packaged, um, you're going to want to make sure that the host, that the host application has the ability to access those resources as well and use them in a, in a fairly uh, standard way. Um, which is why the, the, uh, the API is so critical, making sure that the abstraction level in the target is usable by things that are on the DPU, but is also usable by things that are on the host, should the need arise. It, it's, it's what Rob was talking about by creating uh, different layers uh, where you do a little bit of work and you get a medium level of performance and you can move lower if you need to for optimization purposes. And I think in the chat earlier, there was discussion about optimization in general and that that's not typically the first pursuit. That's pursuit only if you need that pursuit. Um, that, that being said though, there are abs there's absolutely the need to, uh, to create infrastructure components um, that, are, that are, uh, are easily separable uh, from the host itself. Um, uh, I, I've got a few things listed here, and, and I'd love to hear from uh, perhaps some of the customers that I know are on the call. Uh, things like mobile edge compute, uh, where, where some of the more expensive aspects of mobile edge compute are ensuring that some of the, the stacks that are built to support MEC uh, that run certain services are, are, uh, are provisioned properly, um, are managed properly, are monitored properly. Uh, the avoidance of tromboning of traffic in and out of uh, value-added services and back to mech again. Uh, these are things that the DPUs can absolutely assist with. Um, if anybody from the service provider space wants to comment on some of those use cases, I think that would be a good discussion to have. Yeah, I, I do think it speaks to the fungibility of the DPUs and how they can be used. You can either access offloads directly from the host application or an application, a DPU application running on the DPU could use those offloads as well. I do think though that the trend line towards moving away from monolithic applications, breaking things out by functional, um, you know, functional need in a microservices manner, uh, that, that movement in that direction lends itself towards not building infrastructure into the application and trying to offload it on a smart NIC or a DPU, but rather removing that 
functionality from the application and letting it be provided as a service that could be run in a sidecar, but it could also be moved onto a DPU as a service. And so I think that's the, the trend line that applications are moving towards. Any other any other comments on the service provider topic? We we had an earlier discussion in chat that I thought was quite quite good. No, nobody wants to play today. Um, I, I currently don't work for a service provider, but I have worked uh, for, for both cloud and telco service providers in the, the past. And that's where a lot of kind of that layering stack knowledge comes from. I mean, it, and it's just a pattern that I've seen play out over and over again, you know, <clears throat> the application space and the mobile space and most of infrastructure, so. Well, I noted that in the previous conversation, we were talking very low level about how to actually make um, some of the basic functionality of using some of the abstractions that are presented by the DPU by to, uh, as a target. Uh, but looking at it from a higher level, DPUs are incredibly functional devices, roughly equivalent uh, to having a server with a lot of assistive hardware that's loaded into a system. Um, there are some, there's some benefits from power consumption and there are benefits from density. Uh, and so as an ISV, we look at these devices and we say, okay, um, we know when we want to create versions of our services that run using smart NICs, that, that we have to specifically engineer for specific smart NICs and driver versions and kernel version becomes a concern, et cetera. Um, but we get, we get good performance from a network perspective out of that. Um, in some cases, we also you know, provide uh, offload of things like crypto. Uh, but what if we were actually able to take the services that are, are uh, that are behind all of those offload functions and run some of the services co-resident with the accelerator functions. Um, it gives uh, service provider customers uh, a, a little more density and a little, it's better on power consumption. For enterprise customers, it lets them divide apart the infrastructure management and operations components uh, and the, the, uh, the management of the applications that sit behind those things, but allows them to be co-resident with each other. Uh, with good performance. So, so uh, we, we definitely see a, a need for thinking about this problem set uh, in, in much the way that, um, that this slide actually kind of lays it out. Do you mind if I kind of riff on, on that a little bit? So sure. when I talk about this end layer model, the, the way that I've seen work best works to derive that you know, nobody just kind of th sits on the mountain and thinks about it hard and comes down with it. You know, what generally happens is you talk to the application people who want to be on the top and do the least amount of work. And they say, I wish I had an API that just did this. And then you have the hardware people on the bottom saying, okay, well, I think the hardware gets abstracted this way. And this is the API that makes sense to me. And you kind of have these two people tunneling from both sides. And, and that's why I get kind of excited about this type of organization is we have all those people represented to be able to have kind of a tight loop feedback conversation like that. And then, you know, then you iterate and you add another use case and you do some refactoring and you repeat. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's the, the mental model that makes sense for how to get to the world that we're talking about. I, I think that's correct. And, and uh, as, as we, we intend to, to have services that are locally hosted on DPUs, we also need that same advantage of the in layer. Uh, uh, you know, if we if we want to integrate uh, and and just do a software deployment of of a web application firewall in the simplest terms, uh, we can get that hosted service running fine on a DPU. When when we when we then need to take that same hosted service and then access services like uh, like regex, uh, uh, like uh, compression services. Uh, when we want to do normalization passes and we want to, do, to use some of, the, some of the services that are available for that, um, we, we need a consistent interface to allow us to access those services directly on the DPU so that we can create the best, most performance services, uh, service possible. So, so um, whether we are running on the host system and we, we expect that plenty of our products and, and plenty of Nginx is going to be running up in the hosting system, 
Um, we also see that, that the DPU becomes a viable place to do especially certain infrastructure networking uh, functions and infrastructure services for applications that sit behind these devices. Um, Isn't it also going to be super important to make sure we build in, you know, um, hardware discovery and provisioning tooling because it's going to be complex for users to know if and when and what components to put where, you know, and, and um, containers help, but we also need, you know, management of that, right? Um, yeah. So I think Kubernetes can play a big role, but there's going to be new stuff that needs to be added for doing hardware discovery and for figuring out which DPUs are attached to which systems and how they communicate to the host side, to mm -hmm. the DPU side, right? I mean, it's there's a lot of different variables, right? Um, so yeah, Tim Tim Michaels co covered this a little bit yesterday, uh, and I, I I sensed that there was a little confusion over some of the uh, some of the concepts, but uh, the DPU having its own unique network identity is a, is a good place to start with that. Um, it, it allows you to create a separable uh, control and management infrastructure for, for DPUs and, and the tasks that DPUs are, are then going to be pointed at. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the, this, this, uh, this, this does mean that, that, that things like lifecycle management become critical. Um, which is a good way, I guess, to dovetail into the, the next discussion we're going to have after the break on, on lifecycle management. Um, we're also looking at, at, the, uh, at, at how we render services to make the services a little more portable. Uh, for example, uh, we, we, um, uh, we know that most DPUs are ARM-based, um, although that's not set in stone. Uh, I'm sure that there there will be other platform uh, types uh, in 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 uh, DPUs, uh, and so what we're looking at is is ensuring that we're running under Kubernetes for process control and management, but the things that we run under Kubernetes, uh, generating those in ways that are platform type independent. So we're lo we're we're looking at, uh, at at what what we can do in, for example, WebAssembly uh, to provide services that can have one binary, but be distributed across multiple platform types, um, just as a convenience uh, for customers so that they don't, have to, uh, they don't have to have platform type as yet another consideration uh, when, when, they're, when they're managing the services that, that, uh, that we're supplying them. Yeah, not to mention, we'd like to have one application code base that works on an x86 hosted COTS platform as well as on an ARM-based TPU. That would be nice. Yeah. Uh, any other comments about, um, let me switch back to some of the use cases here. Uh, the, these are some of the use cases that we think are relevant um, and I try to divide it apart into service provider and enterprise customers. Um, from the enterprise customer side, uh, you know, the, some of the things that we provide are, are things like API gateway and web application firewall. Uh, there is service mesh, and I noticed, um, uh, Dan, on a slide that you presented uh, that, that, that Intel has done some work, I believe, with Envoy Acceleration uh, and, and service mesh, mesh attachment. And um, we, we also think that, uh, that, that service mesh is, is a good role for DPUs to play because it, it separates it from uh, having the application necessarily know the operations of the mesh that's feeding the traffic to it. Um, creating a separation of that is actually a, a good thing from a security perspective. Yeah, I think that the, 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 these devices can have two different roles there. You know, they can, they can help make the, the service mesh infrastructure go faster because it's, you know, sort of awfully uh, heavyweight, you end up scaling out even more because you, you have to make up for it. So that's sort of like job number one, but job number two is if they are participating in, in scaling out these different services, then they could participate directly and, and you know be able to load balance to these devices, just like any other software service provide, uh, microservice. You know, So you could have a service that says, hey, compress this data and that, that data may get compressed by a, a software service running somewhere, or it may get compressed by 
a DPU IPU sitting right in front of uh, the business logic. So it's it's a really promising area where we can uh, not only help the, uh, the the distinction that you had earlier of the infrastructure application help that infrastructure application run better, but we can also give uh, you know value to the end application by you know not having to provide that end application with a, oh here is your virtual IPU DPU widget thing that you use for compression. Instead, they can just use the the you know sort of the the um, API ingress that they've already established, and uh, the the uh, you know the the device is able to participate in that because it's already participating in the load balancing and provisioning of that um, you know across the whole system. So I have a question. It seems like among this group, to put a really black and white cast on it. There are two attitudes about DPUs. One is, I, I think, is uh, the F5 presenters have kind of talked about. W one view is it's a server and a server that can run real applications. The other view is you perform certain data plane acceleration functions on the DPU, but the main work is in the host. I, this is not the place to do a debate about that. But I, the question I have is, to what extent is that difference in attitude going to get in the way of making progress in this effort to do some standardization and some open source code? It's not a leading question. I really don't know, but it might. That's a good clarifying might... question. Uh, I'm actually not sure who you think falls into that second camp that most of the work happens on the, the server. So well, I, I think... I'm sorry. Well, um... So any, anybody who is, I think, proposing TC is what you use to accelerate OVS, I would guess, is falls into that camp as an example. But maybe I really mean more um, the camp, and I think NVIDIA is mostly in it, where the only way you're going to get performance is you got to modify the code, you know, the quote of Jensen that, <laughs> I don't think it's true, but the, but the quote from Jensen from some presentation he did that said, you want to do 125 gigabits per second, you need 125 cores. Somebody put that up on a slide yesterday. That was us. I, I, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty extreme position, but if you have a slow CPU and a fast accelerator, that's what you'd be advocating. So, but, but maybe that's the way to characterize it, Rob, is this, um, you know, the, the camp that says, no, these things are servers, you can run real code. And the other camp is, no, you got to modify the application and take advantage of accelerators to make these things worthwhile. I did, just an observation that I, I wonder if that's going to get in the way of making progress in this standardization group. Maybe I misunderstood it. I mean, are you saying that there's two camps where one camp only wants to offload infrastructure pieces and believes that most of the actual application logic should reside on the host or there's a camp or maybe that's a different way of partitioning so I, i'm gonna is, yeah that so that's what i said first but let me withdraw that one I, I, that may in fact be sort of pass passe but it certainly was the case i mean i saw enough debates at service mm -hmm. providers around um how, how to accelerate stuff with earlier generations but but i think there definitely still is a case um where um people say the only way you're gonna get performance is to modify the application and make calls yet to be defined that allow vendor independent invocation of acceleration. P P4 solves part of that problem, obviously, but but as people noted, uh, they're, they're the things. Can I judo that question? <laughs> so that, that question kind of assumes that the main benefit of IPU DPU is performance. And, and I guess that's the thing I would push back on. So in my mind, the main value is actually having a hard air gap separation. Uh, and so that gets you security and that gets you, you know, division of responsibility. Meaning you know, if you're in a hosted cloud environment, you have the, the code the customer provides and the code that the infrastructure provides and that they don't really interact except at a network level. And, and I think those are the things that are kind of the core value and the, the performance that you get out of that is more of just an, of course, if you're going to have that environment, you might as well have some, some smart, you know, hardware that accelerates things. But I, I think that's kind of a secondary aspect of it. So Rob, I'm not, I'm not arguing that the only reason you do it is performance. I was thought I was parroting comments made by some of the presenters. Okay. That's 
but but let me yeah. also let me also comment. I, I think you can I think you can make the case that that if you kind of focus on some of these applications that um, you know kind of fall into a category, whether it's load balancing or uh, an uh, NGINX gateway proxy, for example, that there's benefit in getting that off of the host because you free up what's increasingly a scarce resource. So even if there was no, if, if, as long as there was no performance penalty, if you move those functions off to a DPU, you've now freed up a, a more expensive server CPU because it's got a ton of memory. Um, and so it's got higher cost per core inherently, whether or not it's an ARM processor on the DPU. Um, that, that there's benefit in doing that, that's price performance, if not performance. And, and some, I mean, security can be sort of hard to sell. I mean, as, as evidenced by the fact that these things so far haven't rocked the world, um, you know, I mean, metronome, you know, a couple metronome points. And, yeah. I mean, so to, to your kind of high level concern of, you know, is there kind of a, a tension in the, the group that, that, you know, might, you know, re restrict progress? I, I haven't seen that, to, okay. to be honest, and I've been in the beginning of these meetings. And you know, what, the reason why I'm kind of poking at your, your question is not that I, I, I don't agree. I just, I'm trying to get to the heart of it, because if there is something like that, I, I want to get make sure I understand. Uh, at the other hand, I mean, they, there actually is broad deployment of a lot of these devices, uh, just not all the people are talking about it. Uh, you know, I, we can at least, the, the public statement that we can make is that we actually built Mount Evans with Google. Um, and, and I can't provide much data on top of that, but you know, there's a certain level of implication that comes with that. Yeah, I understand. And, but if you look at the market stats between Amazon, Azure, and Google, I mean, the Om Omdia stats say that that dwarfs all of the other um, deployments of DPU-like devices. There, there's a long tail distribution of FPGA use cases, certainly, but well, and at least, and you know, maybe this is more with my Intel hat that I want to have for this meeting, but you know, we would consider an FPGA-based IPU still an IPU. I would too. So if we so, take a air gap concept and then say only workloads that fit that description, meaning a clear separation, either a security boundary or a functionality boundary is what we are considering. But in, in some of the diamond bluff discussions earlier, I think people had expressed a desire to be able to deploy regular services to the DPU. The DPU is powerful enough that you could make a choice that since it's an independently managed entity, that there are some services for certain deployments, I can say this available compute or capability on the DPU, I'll just deploy it there. So, is there any resistance to that kind of an idea? So I understand that some of the things we're talking about, the infrastructure pieces can be fairly complex. Uh, the load balancer as an example, or so th these are heavy duty workloads, but there's still a certain, like Rob said, an air gap separation. But do you want to consider cases where it's being treated as just another node on the cluster? You deploy <laughs> services to it. I think you're going to see users who want to do that, whether this community addresses that or not, it, it may be yet to be decided. But I think, you know, the point I brought up earlier about hanging accelerators off of DPUs is going to push that, right? Where there's going to be people who say, hey, my only GPU in my server is hanging off of my DPU. And I want to put my application that's using that GPU as close to it as possible. So I'm going to stick it on the DPU, right? And in that case, you potentially have broken some of those security air gapped things, right? So it may be that there are some use cases where the security air gap is crucial and needs to be maintained. And there are some where it won't be. How this community addresses those, I think we need to debate that, right? But I, I agree with you that I think that there are both. And uh, I think a thing that will be hard for us to do, but critical is to, to come up with terms. So at least, you know, from an Intel perspective, yeah. you know, there is the chip and that can be deployed in a bunch of different use cases. And so the, the use case Chris was talking about, which I think is absolutely important, which is you take a chip and you kind of logically attach it to the server, the, the main server, so that, you know, that you don't have the security, but you do have the performance. I would call that a smart NIC use case. 
And then, you know, the, the use case that we've been talking predominantly about here, where you kind of have these two independent servers and you do have that security and air gap, I would call that a, a, an IPU use case where you have this separate infrastructure processing unit. And what makes things complicated is the same chip can be used in both cases. It's really more about how it gets hooked up. And, and so I, I do think that both cases can be supported by this team, but I think step one is just agreeing what we're talking about. I, I yeah. completely agree, Rob. Uh, just let me just kind of drill in on one point and then I'll quit hogging the, the mic. But uh, if, if I look at what's the kind of the dynamic environment of what service mesh proxies are doing, I mean, there's a bunch of criticisms around the sidecar model because it's kind of hard to accelerate, for example. But, but also you look at several of those projects, they've been really dynamic. And so figuring out what the optimal place to insert hardware acceleration might be different if you looked at Envoy and said, okay, that's a stable project. We haven't made any significant API changes in a year. We can you know, really optimize hardware acceleration. If you're in a really dynamic environment, you can certainly optimize at a lower level based upon what network functions it calls. So that's one point. I think the other one that I'm a little worried about in terms of complexity is if this organization is really gonna work on how do you manage these things? It's pretty different if you say, this is an accessory to the host server and should be managed through the server versus that happens to be in the same chassis, doesn't take a footprint, connects via CPI or via PCI, the NICs are shared, but it's a server and a server and it can be managed separately. I think from a management standpoint, that, that potentially is, there, there are ways to deal with it, but, but I think maybe hard to accommodate the second case if people are focused on it's an accessory to a server and is managed to the server. Yeah, and then I would say you have even a third use case where you know it's, it's a server in and on itself in an edge use case and it's not in another server at all. Um, so I think you have all of those potentially and, and where this community goes is- Most, it, most definitely. Yeah. If I could speak just quickly to your comments, Harry. Um, you know, we're really, we wanna move beyond the smart NIC, so we're not trying to solve the smart NIC problems. But that being said, we don't want to exclude the smart NIC use case. So our frameworks are trying to anticipate providing offloads to the hosted applications on the server and not excluding them or not allowing them. But that's not really our focus. Our focus is on how do we get deployed, hosted, managed applications onto, you know, DPUs and how do we manage DPUs at scale? So yeah, it that's, really is that, that problem. That, it's yeah, a new that, life cycle management problem that we need to solve. That's why we want a new community to do it. Yep. And I've always drawn the line as the difference and being if a device has a separate OS that's managed separately in a separate network identify identity, then it's a separate thing versus yeah. the traditional smart NIC that is more of a peripheral device and doesn't have its own OS. And you know, you can only talk to it via the host, right? So that's sort of how I've always thought of the difference, but I sort of feel like Rob's description of the difference was maybe a little different. So I guess we still have some things to talk about there. I think that's a good point. And that's going to have a immediate bearing on even some of the Red Hat pieces, like but OpenShift as an example, does it treat the DPO IPO as a completely separate, not completely separate, an independent node in its own right, which happens to be connected to the host over PCI? Or is it only managed as an intelligent controller where it's discovered as part of the node discovery process on the host? So I think that distinction is really important. And it's gonna have a bearing on how we do some of the work. And yeah. one, one thing that occurred to me during this discussion is that looking at this picture again and talking about the SmartNIC use case, that maybe an approach is to create a SmartNIC hosted service that when deployed on the DPU presents SmartNIC offloads, presents itself, that service on the DPU presents itself to the host as a SmartNIC with associated offload capabilities. Right? That's sort of a way of packaging up that traditional SmartNIC offload capability in a way that fits the model of deployed services on the DPU. Just an idea. Uh, good discussion, thank you. Uh, Harry, just to uh, sum up everything, I, I think that there is room for both of those use cases. 
I don't necessarily sense, and I've been involved from the start as well, uh, as is Rob, I don't sense any tension uh, really between the people who are interested in, in the first one and the second one. Uh, I, I think that, that uh, it, it largely, the conversation that you've heard in all of these presentations uh, takes on the flavor of the people who work inside of a specific technology daily. From our perspective, we, we expect that if you're looking at this particular diagram, we, we, we have to live in a world where an end user of this uh, service that we provide is either putting us on the host or hosting system side, or they desire to put the service into the DPU. Um, we have to exist in the, a world where both are true. Yep, understood. Okay, uh, any other questions? Anybody have anything to raise? Um, just, going, just going back to that uh, uh, question of the you know peripheral versus separate device is certainly we, we made the, I guess the scoping decision uh, a, uh, a while back for IPDK to just focus on the latter, just focus on the independent device use case. Uh, it's just um, otherwise we're already boiling an ocean, but it's easier when you're only boiling one. <laughs> yeah. One ocean versus all the oceans. Yes. Right. Yeah. So uh, j just to kind of touch back on the security air gap topic, um, and I, I I wanted to do this because um, when when Tim spoke yesterday, uh, he talked about having a root of trust that belonged to the DPU, and there was quest there was a question as to why why exactly that was desirable. Uh, and the simple answer is because you, you may have secrets that you want to store on DPU that the host should have no access to. Uh, things like uh, keys or secrets needed for encapsulation or, or encryption or decryption uh, of an outer tunnel, for example, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, secrets that are involved in, in security features or security functionality um, are often necessary and, and we prefer to store those inside of TPMs uh, if given the opportunity. Um, th this is specifically, of course, for a customer that, that decides that they want to separate the infrastructure uh, offload from the host itself, um, which, which we think is, uh, is going to be um, an interest area for a lot of customers who are dealing with, uh, with, with um, uh, ever larger compute infrastructures. Um, Enterprises are still buying compute. They're, they're, of course, consuming cloud environments as well, but they're also still buying compute uh, and, and they're buying more and more of it. Um, it. It's a good time to be Intel and some of the CPU vendors, I suppose. Um, but at the same time, the cloud providers, the public cloud providers are kind of pointing the way at separating general compute or, or workload compute from infrastructure compute. Uh, so AWS has its Graviton 2 and 3 effort. And of course, you just heard from Intel saying that they worked very intensively with Google on a project for, for infrastructure uh, separation uh, with, with, uh, with DPU hardware. So, so those, they're kind of pointing the way that, that there is a divisibility point between infrastructure and services that run for infrastructure and the workloads that sit behind said infrastructure. Um, so what we'd like uh, as a provider of services is we'd like an environment to plug our services into that we don't have to custom code every single time a brand new piece of hardware comes out from any vendor. Um, and uh, an object lesson, and I, I mentioned this uh, when, when I spoke um, in the opening yesterday, uh, you know, uh, it, there have been, I'm not going to point any fingers at any particular vendors, but there have been times when in order to support a smart NIC use case for our product set, uh, we've had to create multiple versions simply to support multiple revisions of hardware of the same card. So, and that's uncomfortable. Uh, it's, it's a support nightmare from our perspective. So um, uh, creating a more standard environment with more consistent APIs and allowing us to, to kind of float and, and adjust to hardware that customers provision for themselves from, from equipment providers like HP or Dell, that would be a fantastic world for us to live in. All right, uh, with that, I think we're about at the end of time. Uh, Chris, yeah. do you want me to turn it back over? No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joel. And